She has recently uh, been a lecturer here, so some of you may have uh, seen her around the offices, as well as a lecturer in ethnic studies. Her research interests include new media and digital technologies, human security, gender and sexuality, social media, uh, critical GIS gaming, algorithmic geopolitics, and the Middle East. Um, she has also recently had an article accepted uh, at Security Dialogue, which is of course one of the top 10 journals in the field, so it's a really important accomplishment. And that is actually the subject of her talk today, the cartographic ambiguities of harassment. And so I'm going to turn it over to Nicole for the talk, and then we'll have some time for question and answer afterwards. Uh, thank you, Debbie, um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the Department of Political Science for giving me this opportunity to share my research with you today um, on the politics of sexual security and crowd mapping in Cairo, uh, as read through the project of harassment. Um, and as Debbie mentioned, uh, my research uh, on this particular project is being published in Security Dialogue. It's also going to be a chapter in my fourth manuscript uh, titled uh, Gamer Centers Provocateurs, Digital Mediations of Violence, Gender, and Faith in the Middle East. I've changed that title. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to uh, briefly situate my research on harass map <clears throat> in the broader context of my book project, um, which addresses how sexual violence, human security, and women's rights in the Middle East are increasingly conceived of as a technical problem. Uh, that can be solved with the universalization of everyday digital platforms and communications technologies. Um, I'm interested primarily in challenging the so-called neutrality of digital platforms and devices to show how things like commands, codes, and protocols can and do reanimate colonial tropes through the organization of data, uh, and at the same time that they provide new modes of and opportunities for politics. So the project is in part uh, response to a number of prescriptive reports uh, published over the last four years by organizations like the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment uh, of Women, and also the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, which have tried to take stock of what they see as the backsliding of the women's agenda in the Middle East after the 2011 demonstrations. So these reports foreground abstract notions of equality, democracy, and freedom uh, for women uh, through religious and cultural reform, uh, enabled specifically by social media and other forms of network communication. So the end goal of these interventions is that uh, Arab and Muslim women might either be given opportunities to change or circumvent restrictive political and cultural institutions, or where such a disposition might be lacking, be taught to turn away from religious conservatism and support uh, more uh, enlightened versions of social and political change. So there's a growing scholarship that's very critical of these discourses and their appeal to culturalist explanations for lack of gender equality in the region. Um, however, the extent to which this scholarship engages the actual technologies of mediation themselves, uh, these critiques generally center on issues of technological determinism, meaning that the technology drives politics and values, uh, or technocentrism, meaning that all questions about rights or politics should be oriented toward technology. Um, so my work speaks to this scholarship in that it does try to provincialize how people in America and in Europe use social media, um, but it also is trying to do something a bit different. Um, I'm trying to engage here the agentic capacity of digital media and uh, <coughs> communications technologies um, and how certain modes of gender and racialized knowledge about the Middle East are produced through specific ways of organizing and representing data. Um, so I use a very interdisciplinary approach uh, to show how politics in the Middle East has important implications for theories of global communication and the networks of material labor that support it. Um, uh, it's important to uh, internationalizing studies on internet and race, uh, and also uh, in, in incorporating digital communication to work on the subjective limits of liberalism and social theory. Um, so one of the key concepts uh, at work in my project is the interface, which I uh, use to think through questions of intermediality and relationality. Um, so I do this through a kind of socio-technical analysis of material engagements with digital platforms uh, to think about the relationship between users and machines uh, but also relationships between different interfacing technologies in order to disrupt these sometimes what we think of as established categories, right? Woman or Arab or digital divide, 
that are often treated as having inner dynamics that are already firmly established. So I also engage uh, new media scholars who take humanistic approaches uh, and practices and apply them to the study of computing. So Ian Bogost's um, outline of different areas of focus in this study of computational media have been really useful to me in thinking through this question of technical agency in the context of the so-called woman problem in the Middle East, uh, as well as for thinking about computational media and social analysis together. So uh, first uh, is uh, reception and operation. So what is the experience of the user when they're engaging these technologies, and how is that experience expressed? And I'm not just looking at how information is expressed by people and then relayed by data, but also how information is expressed visually. Uh, organizationally and also quantitatively. Um, the interface is another. Uh, so here I'm looking at relations that are happening at the site of the visible or operable part of a computer system uh, between people and computer systems, but also between computer systems themselves. Uh, and then finally, form and function, what are the operations and behaviors of the program? So the book is oriented around a theory chapter and then four substantive chapters that each engage a kind of high-profile media event in or about the Middle East that attracted an intensification of discourse uh, about gender violence, sexuality, and rights. Um, so in the first chapter, which I'll be discussing in more detail today, I looked at Graphs Map, which is a Cairo-based interactive online mapping interface for reporting and geocoding and then visualizing incidents of sexual harassment in real time in Egypt using the Yushihi crowd mapping platform. Um, my chapter on uh, network nudity looked at how uh, algorithmic and normative protocols embedded in social media platforms generate certain forms of gender and political communication while prohibiting others. So I do this through a reading of the use of nudity by two women, one in Egypt and one in Tunisia, uh, as a form of protest on social media. And then I draw parallels between the bureaucratic management of dissenting gendered bodies and then the bureaucratic management of their bodies as data. So uh, when, when posted to platforms like Facebook, these bodies are, uh, along with millions of other flagged pornographic and violent images, categorized as spam. Uh, and then they are redirected along the same channels of labor exploitation and technological waste to a hidden network of low-wage content moderators, uh, generally countries in the global south that are tasked with making social media safe for the rest of us. Um, so my chapter on GCOM, uh, focuses on Saudi women gamers and uh, Saudi women's gaming communities in, in, Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, and how educational video games produced by Saudi women function as discursive, as fields of discursive production about women's negotiation of spatial segregation, mobility, and social critique within the kingdom. Um, and then I also did a digital ethnography of Saudi women cosplayers who reappropriate the abaya in order to offer kind of materiality to gender and morally ambiguous characters uh, during women-only uh, gaming conventions. So this is a character, Hidan, from the comic strip Naruto, uh, some of you may know about it, and then this is um, No Face from Spirited Away. And then finally, uh, in this chapter, which is the one that was not in my dissertation and is in progress right now, um, I consider how image-based social networks such as Instagram and Snapchat are changing the way that the female body is made visible during times of war. So specifically, I'm looking at how the selfie is used to organize women's bodies within the rhetorical context of racist military violence uh, related to the uh, Zion stand-up hashtag, which was very popular during the latest military siege on Gaza, the Gaza in summer 2014. So a lot of people talking about these images online have framed them within these narratives of extreme narcissism or uh, moral ineptitude, but I'm looking at the selfie here as a genre within the larger context of this historical sublimation of sexual desire in the service of racist nationalism and as a form of digital and reproductive labor performed by women's bodies in the context of occupation. Um, so for the rest of my presentation, I'll be focusing on harassment. Um, and I'll be discussing the project's uh, specific uh, the project-specific policing techniques in the context of what I identify as an incipient merger between UN gender discourses on sexual security and the use of crowdsourced data for human security governance. 
So I explained how HarassMap employs a particular territorial strategy to capture and redefine the policing of urban sociality as a three-dimensional space, um, from satellites to mo mobile handheld devices. And this enables the project to make visible particular kinds of targets through the project's mapping interface. Um, just to give you a bit of background about the project, um, HarassMap went public about a month before the January 2011 Egyptian Revolution. Uh, where accounts of the popular protests there um, were, uh, that led to the eventual ouster of Hosni Mubarak uh, were frequently presented alongside reports of things like forced virginity tests, um, women being beaten, insulted, and raped during these demonstrations. Um, and then the issue of sexual <coughs> violence in Egypt actually received heightened international attention with this very high profile assault of CBS reporter Lara Logan. Um, which emphasized uh, mob-style attacks on women protesters and accounts of the Arab street uh, teeming with these hypersexualized, hypermasculinized mobs of young Arab men. So the idea was uh, developed. The idea for the project was developed by two women who were working for the Egyptian Center for Women's Rights in Cairo, um, Rebecca Chayo, uh, who is an American. Uh, she's a graduate of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, so Johns Hopkins Sice. Uh, currently acts as the director of the project. And then NG Goslan, she's an Egyptian women's rights activist. Um, and since its initial launch, launch, the project has received a two-year grant from Canada's International Development Research Center. Uh, it's raised tens of thousands of dollars through crowdfunding campaigns, uh, and it's also received several international awards. Um, so HarassMap uses the Ushahidi open source crowd mapping platform and Frontline SMS to create a cartographic representation of incidents of sexual assault that are reported through multiple channels and data streams using SMS, SMS texting, email, Twitter, and the HarassMap website. Um, Ushahidi uses the Google Maps application programming interface, which is also called Google Maps API. Uh, this allows Google Maps to be embedded as a base map into the websites of third-party developers. And so it's, it's called a Yushahidi implementation. So as a Yushahidi implementation for geocoding and georeferencing incidents of harassment, harassment presents geovisualized data points that represent spaces of violence which are then geolocated through positional information reported, for instance, through an SMM or an SMS report. Um, uh, so harassment highlights how the spatial navigation of urban life is never a frictionless terrain of movement for women. But it is always gendered and sexualized and must therefore be negotiated to minimize the possibility of violence. However, Harass Maps interfacing with Google Maps also allows the project to engage in a kind of multi-scalar targeting of harassment that resonates with other projects of securitization in the biopolitical ordering of urban space. So my interest in this project is not on whether or not it works, whether or not it does something to stop sexual harassment in Egypt. Rather, I'm interested in HarassMap's specific configuration of data collection, processing, and representation through crowd mapping, and how that produces particular knowledge of the targeting of dangerous people, dangerous streets, and even whole neighborhoods that are based on an ethics of precision. And so this is evidence that discourse is produced by and about the project that celebrate its ability to produce these multi-scalar targets from pictures of individual harassers whose images are uploaded to the site, uh, to the visual identification of hotspots on the harassment map where what they call rescue operations and communications campaigns can be deployed. Um, so to the extent that HarassMap seems unequivocally positive, the location of the problem of gendered violence in Arab culture, uh, its reliance on the trope of victimhood, and its appeal to both international organizations and local law enforcement are implicated in a project of population management that works through an assemblage of interfacing actors, objects, and affects that animate colonial archives of sexuality and Arabness. So as these archives resonate with new techniques of mapping and targeting, the project produces a series of tensions through the demands for the expansion of the state's policing powers, uh, for more punitive sanctions on harassers amidst crackdowns on anti-government sentiment, uh, new prohibitive laws on public assembly, and the sexual torture of women and men who are arrested for protesting while in state custody. 
So um, spatial navigation technologies have very deeply militarized roots, but they are, like all technologies, ambivalent and contingent in how they organize knowledge. So we can see this in the increasing public use of these technologies through platforms like Google Earth and Google Maps. And there's a large literature on the use of spatial or geospatial technologies, rather, and mapping platforms in theorizations of geopolitics. Um, Lisa Park's essay on Google Earth's crisis in Darfur project is a great example of how mapping platforms mediate affective uh, visual cartographic arrangements of uh, satellite imagery, war photography, graphic narratives, uh, and human rights monitoring that are meant to provoke particular responses and preface particular geopolitical agendas. So this is a picture from Crisis in Darfur. Um, and there's also a smaller but a growing body of work on what's called digital humanit humanitarianism. So this work looks at how GIS technologies in particular uh, enable large unrestricted numbers of remote users to collaborate in humanitarian management and how the reliance on remote processing aggregation and the representation of user-generated data results in each program or project producing its own form of knowledge politics that can become temporarily fixed in the software, in the hardware, and in the social practices that engage those technologies. So focusing on the instrumentality of devices employed by harassment provides insights into how the project reorganizes concerns about development and modernization toward a gendered security paradigm invested in forms of feminist internationalism where universal uh, criteria, and measurable criteria related to issues of sexual violence are increasingly being thought of in terms of surveillance and policing in UN gender discourses. So critical feminist engagements with human security have raised important concerns about gender, racial, and class-based exclusions produced in the construction of universal notions of human values, instead highlighting the ambiguity of security and arguing for an emphasis on relationality and context and how security is conceived and operationalized. Um, my study of Grass Map contributes to this literature in two ways. So first, it brings feminist security studies into conversation with feminist geographic research and also post-colonial cartography engaging GIS technologies uh, to look at how the project's use of crowd mapping produces racial and class-based exclusions in the interest of sexual security. Um, second, it suggests an incipient shift in how the use of crowdsourcing and crowd mapping by international organizations is reorganizing the focus of human security from the individual to what Dilo's terms the individual. And this is a concept that describes how embodied human subjects are endlessly divisible and reducible to data representations via modern technologies of control, where information about ourselves can be separated <coughs> from us and resynthesized in ways that we often don't have any control over. So as women who are subjected to sexual violence are encouraged to identify themselves as targets of intervention, their experiences are then aggregated at the intersections of class, age, race, gender, and education level to demonstrate large quantities or patterns of violence. And so once this happens, it's no longer a particular person's experience or life that's to be sec secured. Instead, aggregate sums of experiences replace any one woman's life to determine the success or the failure of an operation or an intervention, as well as for indexing uh, the targets of those operations. So you have spaces and life worlds that become decontextualized and made sensible to a quantitative index used to determine how liberal or illiberal a neighborhood, a city, or even an entire region is. So here the streets of Cairo become a space in which the highly sexualized bodies of Egyptian men and women are tracked, tagged, and coded in ways that may seem innocuous, but in fact fall into a dispositif of security that renders this data useful in establishing certain relations of force. So Palmar describes um, this phenomenon of UN-affiliated NGOs working locally on the issue of harassment in Egypt within uh, what he terms a middle-class law enforcement-centered rescue protection framework. So my reading of HarassMap pushes Mars analysis further into the government of things, and specifically toward the performative role of material objects and practices of securitization and how they produce particular frameworks for security that privilege international norms and a middle-class consumerist understanding of public space that mutate older epics of racial and sexual knowledge. So 
So uh, a bit just about how the project functions. Um, harassment has both an Arabic and an English interface uh, for reporting harassment where individ individuals are prompted to assign the incident a particular category provided by the site. So this could be touching, rape, cat calls, uh, phone calls, things like that. Um, they're also asked to give the location of the incident, uh, a summary of what happened, along with a series of demographic indicators, including gender, age, level of education, and so forth. Um, the harassment maps, or the harassment uh, research team regular, regularly reviews the map to identify what it terms hotspots, uh, where community organizers are deployed and communica communica communications campaigns are deployed aimed at encouraging action against sexual harassment in accordance with a series of guidelines that are provided by the organization. Um, so Chayo, who's the director, says about the outreach program, uh, she says that it takes a social approach to addressing harassment. She says, we do direct intervention, interventions to rescue the women, but in our normal long-term work, we target bystanders to intervene. So it's very kind of militarized language. Um, so uh, these are just some images uh, from their communications campaign online. Uh, volunteers are trained to speak with people on the street, and printouts of the map are distributed to demonstrate proof of the problem as endemic to a particular area. So those with whom harassment makes contact are asked to sign an agreement that they will intervene when acts of harassment occur according to the guidelines provided. And in instances where people are reluctant to sign a contract, uh, Karasmap will read this contract to them and will ask them for a verbal agreement and will sign it on their behalf. Karasmap also encourages shop owners uh, to sign a pledge and to put stickers in their windows indicating their support for the project with the promise of potential revenue generation and as a visual marker of Karasmap's presence on the street. So I think these techniques allow us to situate Karasmap Within a particular system of UN-recognized feminist campaigns <coughs> identified by Amar that emerged between 2003 and 2010, which rejected class-conscious movements for social change and instead focused on cultural explanations for gender violence. And so these organizations working within this framework call for an intensification of policing on the streets uh, to combat harassment and promoted campaigns geared toward uh, what's called social respectability that facilitated securitized and militarized appropriations of internationalist gender and security interventions. So for example, uh, Harass Map's 2010 to 2012 annual report, uh, which despite acknowledging that some instances of sexual violence reported to the site were actually committed by Egyptian security forces, uh, focuses its criticism of the police and the military solely in terms of their lack of presence or their lack of willingness to intervene when other people are harassing women on the street. And so Chayo has also advocated in numerous interviews for increased policing on Egyptian streets, and has advocated for the map to be used to direct police activity toward these so-called hotspots. Um, so Amar outlines uh, the development of the legislative language, language around sexual harassment as a human security priority within UN gender discourses beginning in October 2000, with the UN Security Council Resolution 1345, which was designed to mainstream gender into practices of peace and security among member states, as well as the incorporation of this resolution in the 2005 UN Development Program's Arab Human Development Report, which identified the problem of sexual harassment, and in particular, the discriminatory dispositions of Arab men as a human security concern. Now, the Egypt, Egyptian government has also used uh, the resolution uh, in 2009 as a precedent for consolidating executive powers and increasing security during civil unrest supposedly to protect women from street harassment. Um, the research also provides a, val a valuable context for considering the use of geospatial technologies in ordering and managing urban populations and how crowdsource mapping is emerging as a preferred technique within global human security governance. So UN General Assembly, Assembly Resolution 61110 established what's called the UN Platform for Space-Based Information and Disaster Management and Emergency Response, also called UN SPIDER, on December 14, uh, 2006. And this stated goal of UN SPIDER is to provide universal access to all countries and all relevant international and regional organizations to all types of space-based information and services relevant to disaster 
and disaster risk management. So in 2011, the UN General Assembly <coughs> Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space released another report, AC 105-1007, uh, which emphasized the importance of crowdsourced mapping facilitated by spatial technologies, satellite imagery, telecommunication satellites, and global navigation satellite systems for disaster management. And they also acknowledge the importance of collaborative ventures between UN Spider and it's what they call voluntary technical communities, of which Yushihidi is one of them, but also include uh, things like OpenStreetMap and Crisis Mappers um, and Google MapMaker. So Yushihidi is an example of how advances in software and mobile technologies have facilitated the move of geospatial data collection from commercial uses to crowdsourcing data for human security governance. Crowd mapping has become increasingly <coughs> popular for addressing what Yushihidi co-founder Eric Hurstman calls the problem of wasted crisis management, which he explains as an ability to produce crowdsourced reports in excess of the ability to consume them. Now, crowdsourcing, how crowdsourcing speaks to a particular kind of relationship between space and calculation that contributes to a phenomenon that Crampton and Eldon have identified as uh, the mathematization of the subject, where space <coughs> is uh, amenable to thought through particular forms of calculative rationality. Now, in the case of harass map, crowd mapping produces a particular visualization of urban life where statistical inferences about sexual violence remain distinct from questions of economics, inequality, militarization, austerity, and geopolitical relations. Now, I draw a uh, scholarship on the vertical dimensions of security, including work by Ian Wiseman here to discuss harass maps use of mapping as a territorial strategy to capture and redefine the policing of sociality as a three-dimensional space. So here, the securitization of feminist internationalism dovetails with practices of aerial targeting that are not dissimilar from what Wall and Monaghan have called the drone stare. So this is a form of surveillance that abstracts life on the ground and reduces difference, variation, and noise in an effort to achieve strategic advantage through systems of verticality. Um, so Brandon Hewitt's work on Google Earth urbanism also provides insight for thinking about harass maps and how it presents a vertical solution to the problem of sexual violence. So in their account, uh, global satellite imagery, digital cartography, geospatial data collection, Street-level digital imagery, social media, and other data and software that make up Google's mapping interface are combined as an always-on interactive landscape. Mm. These platforms become a flexible and multi-scale portal through which urban life can be enacted, mediated, and experienced, and where our relationship to the world is one that is becoming radically accessible, zoomable, and panable in a myriad of mobile and near real-time ways. Now, the fact that Google does not produce any of its own aerial images does not diminish from the fact that patterns of information have the potential to become real and reinforced as Google is continually relied on as a true representation of the offline world. So here, new kinds of public consciousness through particular aesthetics and visibility uh, make certain kinds of knowledge visible while obscuring others. So these layered regimes of visibility, access, and control that are embedded in these interfaces speak to harass maps use of geospatial data for targeting, as well as the use of the harassment map as irrefutable, irrefutable evidence that sexual violence is happening in a particular location. So as Rebecca Chaka notes, it's so easy to zoom in, make a printout of the map, and bring it to people in the streets and show them this is our neighborhood. <coughs> Harass map points uh, also out to how advances in mobile technology have <coughs> territorialized the capacity for aerial su surveillance from overhead images produced by military grade satellites to quotidian ground level mobile communications devices for capturing video, photographs, and other forms of data. So the complex interfacing between practices, technologies, people, and policies creates um, what I call a target chain, which is used to direct harass maps management of Egypt's urban spaces. So my use of the target chain is inspired by Der Derek Gregory's theorization of what he calls the kill chain in his discussion of more overt forms of violence in drone warfare and unmanned aerial vehicles, or uh, UAVs. Uh, in Gregory's description, a kill chain uh, is the dispersed apparatus of network actors, affects, objects, discourses, and practices that produce targets as these elements pass through the chain. 
So the process of passing through creates particular kinds of subjects when bureaucratic practices and acute forms of violence are brought to together in the creation of targets. So harassment's less overtly militaristic forms of intervention are also comprised of an assemblage of disparate and dispersed elements, including Egyptian women, NGOs, liberal international discourses on human rights, smartphones, GIS software, the Ushahidi platform, uh, local shopkeepers, international donors, also images of young Arab men in moving cars, and security states that are drawn together in the creation of decisive objects for aerial targeting. So through its community <coughs> mobilization campaigns, harassment engages everyday citizens in the practice of targeting on the street when they are asked to speak out against harassment in uploading reports and taking photos of harassers with mobile devices, and in identifying target areas for community <coughs> intervention. So I think we should give closer consideration to the networked engagements between ground and air surveillance that make it possible for harass, harass map to act on real objects in complex urban environments where the violence of such interventions have all otherwise become increasingly abstract and obscure. So this is in part, I think, a result of crowd mapping so-called utility, as well as discourses of innovation and progress that filter into harass maps uh, use imagery and navigation to be able to intervene on victims' behalf with increasing precision. Yet, harassment's ability to hit a specific target is not the same thing as not hitting anything else. So the targets visualized through the harassment map interface are also more than just a mark on the map representing a toucher or a rapist. In fact, it might be more accurate to say that harassment produces a series of interfacing targets. So there is the materiality of the target themselves, which are actual people, objects, and environments that can be acted upon immediately. Uh, in ways that make these interventions seem very abstract. Um, and then within this material and kind of holographical target space are racialized and sexualized women who themselves become targets for rescue operations. Um, there's also Egypt's so-called social acceptability of harassment as a target, which plays into culturalist explanations for sexual violence that rely on Orientalist tropes of unchecked masculine aggression and the predatory sexuality of the so-called Arab street which Lamar suggests uh, resonates with a commonly accepted presumption that Egypt needs an authoritarian government to keep its politics and population in order. Now, more importantly, the idea that the proliferation of sexual violence emerged as a result of the power vacuum left by Mubarak's ouster is factually inaccurate. Uh, sexual violence committed by security forces, police, and hired thugs, or Baltagia, was frequently used, a uh, frequently used element of the Egyptian security apparatus's repertoire political intimidation techniques. So I go into some detail about this in the chapter. I'll just mention a couple of them here. There's one a particular event known as Black Wednesday when in May 2005, security forces held back crowds so that plainclothes police could beat and sexually assault four women. Uh, some of them were journalists. Um, and they were just calling for a boycott of a constitutional <coughs> amendment that would strengthen Mubarak's position in government and solidify the succession of his son, Mamal. Um, I also talk about how in November 2008, Egyptian security forces arrested 400 young men and boys between the ages of 15 and 17 for flirting offenses. Uh, and according to Cairo police director uh, Farouk Lachine at the time, uh, this was seen as a victory among many women's groups demanding for more police intervention on the street. A similar culture of terror continues under al-Sisi's rule despite recent overtures to international demands for more government response to the issue. So Egypt signed the UN Declaration of Commitment to End Sexual Violence in Conflict in 2013. In 2014, made sexual harassment a criminal offense, <clears throat> with a punishment of up to five years in jail and fines ranging, ranging from 400 to 7,000 pounds. Now, however, the enforcement of sexual harassment law seems highly selective at best and at worst is used as a justification for extending police brutality um, and, under, uh, and extending mass arrests of protesters. So harassment has almost nothing to say about the role of the Egyptian government and Egyptian security forces in directly perpetuating a culture of sexual terror among its citizens. When explaining why they think sexual harassment has become so common in Egypt, they argue that no data exists to explain this phenomenon but that based on their experience, it seems reasonable to contribute it to a form of general aggression, power, and violence within Egyptian society. Women are more likely to be attacked, in their explanation, because they occupy a lower position within society, 
and the government's passive attitude toward the problem of sexual harassment seems to be exacerbating the issue. However, the examples of sexual violence illustrated above seem anything but passive. So bringing the discussion of precision back in, these examples provoke the question of what else might lie beyond the radius of the blast, so to speak, of HarassMap's targeting campaign. Does the HarassMap team and its volunteers consider those who might not otherwise become targets of the state, for instance, women who are protectively detained from harassment during protests? Are these women simply considered collateral damage and an overall appeal to more policing of sexual harassment? Can the program offer justifications for its own casualty levels that also arise as sexual harassment becomes more targeted and more decisively, and more targeted and more decisively by security and legal apparatuses? And could the map itself be used and interpreted in a different way? Given the prevalence of the state's use of sexual violence against political dissidents, is it possible that hotspots could also reflect areas where class-based mobilizations are gaining traction? And where these plainclothes thugs and plainclothes police officers might be active? And where do LGBT communities fit or alternative forms of public sexuality? So can the map ever be used to reduce state, in state intervention in political publics rather than increase it? So in closing, um, what I've tried to show here is how harassment's use of crowdsourced data for mapping sexual violence provokes us to think about the relationship between technological contributions to securitization <coughs> and the sometimes hidden violences of feminist humanitarianism that translates Arab bodies, streets, and cities into targets for remote monitoring and intervention. <coughs> the militarized systems and market rationalities from which these technologies have emerged cannot be entirely separated from the techniques of ordering and targeting that they make possible in the specific context of the harassment map. Now, there are certainly variations and diversity in both reports and community spot responses within and across these emerging security scapes. But the map's resonances with other forms of aerial targeting reveal broader patterns that depoliticize class-based politics around the issue of harassment and promote an increased security state presence without acknowledging the incidental violence of this kind of strategy. Uh, treating harassers, streets, and neighborhoods as targets abstracts the political, social, and geographical context of harassment, reducing difference that might otherwise highlight the moral and political ambiguity of the map, and has the potential to normalize the ongoing subjugation of those who find themselves outside these norms and legal regulations as they become racialized and sexualized targets for discriminatory observation and intervention. The aerial observations operate on multiple discursive and affective registers, where categories and identities that are created by the map are far from objective. They include, but are not limited to, Beltegui and civilian, women and middle class consumers, working class youth, and the Arab street. When used as evidence of gendered sexual violence, the map blurs how these categories are constructed and conflated flattening their nuance into a calculative set of variables that can be geolocated, ordered, and filtered into zones of security and insecurity. These zones are then constructed as the differential borders between the discursive tropes of developed and underdeveloped, between civilized and backwards, and so forth. If we take harassment, which makes claims about the moral significance of its precision technology at its word, how can such technology be used in a way to help stop gender sexual violence against women without depoliticizing the strivings of working class Arab youth or obscuring other extant examples to combat gendered sexual violence? I can see that the Yushahidi platform works very differently when it is used, for instance, to locate individuals and communities in need of provisions after a tsunami or an earthquake, or when it attempts to locate hotspots of sexual then, then when it attempts to locate spots hotspots of sexual violence. Also, the targeting logics that organize the harassment project may work very differently in Cairo than they do in other locations. Uh, the geospatial technologies that harassment uses and the biopolitical management of Egyptian or urban sociality remain open to experimentation and offer the possibility of becoming a tool for bringing a heightened awareness to other types of violence where certain categorical adjustments and visual uh, reorientations would be needed. Now, what might the same technologies be used to police young Arab men do? if they were redirected, for example, at Egypt's security forces and its implementation of state-sanctioned violence against women to thin their presence on the street. This potential resides in the realm of speculation for now. Still, I think we should be wary of the idea that better, more total surveillance will produce more accurate depictions of the environment of gendered sexual violence. 
We should also be critical of paradigms of risk management that seek to sort whole populations into profiles and probabilities as part of a feminist internationalist organization of security governments in Egypt. Thank you. So obviously, you know, harass map is something that is predated by technologies of crime fighting and is also related to technologies like you alluded to, drone technology, etc. So I guess my question might be, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a sort of large question, but could you like place harass map in the context of a more global um, securitization, mathematization. Um, yes, I mean, I think I tried to do that in talking about kind of increased uses of these technologies for disaster management. Um, uh, it was used, uh, um, it's also been used uh, for uh, specifically with, with, with uh, regard to sexual violence. Um, uh, there's uh, in Syria and also in Cambodia as well and in India. But um, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about how it's used in this way is this really, really low numbers of reports. So it doesn't seem to be something that women are using regularly. So I'm sort of wondering, one of the things that I kind of haven't quite figured out yet is why. Um, but maybe kind of what I've been writing about has something to do with that. But there's been a lot written about crowd mapping and racial profiling, uh, but just not about the Middle East and not a lot mm -hmm. it written about uh, sexual violence. But yes, I do think it kind of fits within this literature. I think it's fits in that literature. The thing, one of the things that came to mind, particularly when you mentioned these young men who were arrested by the Egyptian police for flirting, um, was the whole phenomenon of lynching and rape in the United States and the feminist um, movement's response to that and the theoretization of intersectionality um, that various people like Kimberly Crenshaw have sort of applied to that. And I was wondering whether um, there was anything in this work that you see as paralleling that or whether you're drawing from from that, particularly in terms of the women's reporting, and and in that sort of um, in that phenomenon, the way that white women were employed uh, as reporters, uh, even sometimes <coughs> the will, um, and also the ways that um, that the patriarchy, that the the, the um, Sexualization and um, and patriarchy is reinforced by the defending of women against men who are others. Um, so I, th I I thought of that as you were talking about the Egyptian police and uh, and all of this, and I'm wondering where that comes in. Oh, and I had I had not thought about its relationship to lynching. Um, but I think that's a really, it's a really provocative question, something that I would want to think more about. Um, I mean, what, I mean, it definitely has to do with questions of sexuality and patriarchy, for sure, and why, you know, why do some people feel like uh, 
more surveillance, more total surveillance, right, is sort of the answer to kind of giving us a better picture of the environment of sexual security, right? And I think, like what you had said, that the fact that it abstracts all of, of these other elements, right, because that's just it's kind of the nature of the map, right? It presents a, a visual kind of representation of reports, and everything is sort of sublimated or subsumed, rather, by that. Um, so it makes it very difficult. I mean, for me, it, it kind of brings up the question of whether or not the map is actually salvageable, and where should we be looking to kind of more sort of local or indigenous uh, ways of addressing sexual violence, which, which are happening in Egypt, but they're not getting two-year grants from the, the Canadian Development Program, and they're not getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in crowdsource funding. Uh, Kevin? Yeah. <clears throat> My question follows up on what you just said. I was thinking about alternatives that other parts of the world feminist groups have have responded to uh, sexual violence in urban spaces in ways that don't further empower the state. Like just a few examples would be in in Israel where the focus is on getting security guards to not take their guns home because the guns are used in domestic violence, or in Okinawa where what the women do is they compile lists of all the sexual assaults by American military men on Okinawan girls and women, and they're in order to critique militarization, not to expand it, right? And then there's the sort of the, I can't tell you what city this is, where there's a, uh, what time is it, movement, where people are organized to intervene in acts of sexual aggression by going up to the aggressor and seeing what time is it. Because you distract them, they look at their watch, you know, they uh, pull out their phone. Uh, and so it's, I mean, I, I, I can imagine all of those would have potentially negative sides to them, but why this one? Is it just because there's so much money in this one? Why is it so popular? Yeah. I think it kind of appeals to this, this idea of a technological solution to the problem. So, you know, there have been really kind of uh, you know, militaristic overtures to intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq on behalf of women, right? People are sort of losing their enthusiasm for that. But this seems like, you know, the brand new, kind of more effective, like less, less violent way of being able to do that, right? We just turn the technology over to these women and we, we assume that they use it in a particular way to, to get a particular kind of effect. And so, I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to do kind of in the project more generally to say that people use technology in different ways, right? And this idea that, that other people will just mimic it in the same way that we think that they will is, is kind of, you know, it's just not, it's not very nuanced. And it also kind of feeds into kind of, uh, you know, very kind of orientalist ideas of nemesis. And that's been written about in other contexts too, not just in the context of world. But, um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure what else I can add to that question, but, but yeah. <coughs> There are, there are other ways that it's being addressed that just don't get the internet in attention. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, how sexy the technology is. So. Oh. Brian? Um, I, this was making me think about London's affinity for CCTV surveillance and how this kind of analysis that hones in on sexual violence and um, maybe certain kinds of, the, you know, the physical uh, traits of certain individuals versus London, which is like trying to solve crime generally um, against all kinds of individuals. And not, so there's not the same kind of uh, knowledge politics, maybe. Um, but I was wondering if there were any parallels there. Yeah, I mean, in, in part, it's not really just about stopping harassers, right? But it's about producing a particular kind of public sexuality in the street as well. So. Um, you know, uh, so I think in that sense, yes, but, um, you know, and, and maybe like criminalizing whatever it is that doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. Well, because I was thinking about how there isn't a harass map in, right now you're saying it's just in Cairo, but um, how there maybe they there have, are other things. There's one in Syria, mm -hmm. there's one in Syria, there's one in Cambodia, um, and I think just those two places, but it's not, it's, they're using the new Shahidi platform, but they call themselves something else, but harass map does have global aspirations. So they see this as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, first kind of, uh, like, a test, like a testing program in, in a way, but they do see it kind of branching out to other places, other cities. 
And thank you for your presentation. I learned a lot about your work that um, is new to me and, and pretty exciting to think through. And um, so I guess one of the questions, my question really is about sort of what is your methodology for thinking through that relationship between um, you know, what's happening on the ground and sort of that, um, the complexity and nuance of the ground and in these very specific kinds of places. And then your analysis of um, technology and your treatment and thinking of it and about it. Um, again, it's a, it's a new area for me, and so I'm really interested in, in learning more about your approach. So I wouldn't say I have a methodology. I think the closest thing that maybe I could relate it to would be something like after network theory. But I see my work as more kind of organized around a series of questions and relationships between people and technology. So I have literatures that I turn to to think about the questions that I ask. And so some of those literatures include uh, critical cartography, the post-colonial cartography, um, feminist security studies, uh, H HCI, visual studies. Um, but this was, uh, I'll just kind of go back. I mean, these are really the questions that I'm sort of concerned with, and I kind of, I sort of start, you know, I start from a position of kind of thinking these things through, right? Thinking about what's happening at the site of the interface, right? What's, what, what kinds of relays are happening between people and the program, right? What is the program trying to do? What is the software trying to do? Um, uh, in excess of any sort of intentionality on what we have people, right? Um, uh, and then also, uh, how is the information presented, right? Visually, organizationally, organizationally. But I'm interested in kind of material theories of international relations too, right? Thinking about the performativity of security objects and thinking about questions of human security. Yeah. Um, you were referencing Paul Amar's uh, security archipelago. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that uh, Amar is trying to do is he's also trying to talk about the changing nature of neoliberalism. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering to what extent uh, you can uh, I mean, your study of harassment is telling us something about uh, the changing nature of neoliberalism, particularly, I think, the, the relationship between technology, security, uh, and political economy. And I was wondering whether uh, you, you can, can say a little bit more about the implication of technology, particularly, in moving forward, for example, this kind of neoliberal management discourse uh, around security. So I was wondering what, what, what your insights are. Yeah, I mean, my... I think that there's a really strong relationship between this idea of mathematization of the subject and then also this idea of divisuals. So I'm kind of thinking about those two things together. So what happens, is, you know, when we start incorporating these technologies on a kind of broader scale uh, is that, you know, again, it's, it doesn't seem to me that it's no longer the person that's being secured, but it's the data. And people become sort of separated from that data, right? So it's no longer their experience or their bodies, but it's looking at these kinds of calculations and representations, numerical representations, to, to make claims or judgments about you know, how developed an area is or kind of how in line a particular area is with these international norms. And so I see that as very much related to kind of shifts in neoliberalism, or just maybe not shifts, but just new aspects of it that, you know, the technology reveals, right, when we pay attention to it when we ask questions like the questions that I, that Does I it reveal it or is it implicated as well? Because I think that there's, to some extent, at least, you know, what, what I see here is this kind of uh, connection between, uh, you know, what, what the favorite calls spaces of representation and representational spaces, right, this kind of attempt to capture certain neutrality technically, scientifically, mm -hmm. that in fact actually is deeply implicated in pushing a certain kind of neoliberal discourse or even the production of a certain neoliberal subject or subjectivity. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, it, re it reminded me of kind of the, there's a political ecology literature about counter mapping, so mapping and counter mapping, and the way that's used by a lot of Adat groups, indigenous groups, um, but the way in which it's also problematic, it hardens certain kinds of ways of thinking. It already dismisses the kind of discursive battle that you could potentially have about maps. But my question actually was more about, um, I think, the, the problem of harassment and the production of how that becomes a problem. And, you know, I think. In some ways, there's an empirical question about whether it's really a problem. And then part of what you're saying is that the way in which that problem gets defined is through discursive methods and, and, and technologies like um, harassment. And one of the things that spoke to me was 
the way in which you talk about how it depoliticizes the role of kind of security forces, right, and the former uh, authoritarian regimes and the way in which they were perpetuating that kind of, um, that, those kinds of behaviors. And I'm kind of curious, you know, you're speaking against kind of an orientalist, <coughs> culturalist, religious interpretation of why that problem perhaps is there. Um, but I'm, I'm interested about the relationship you see between the kind of state policy, the state practices, and also the emergence of how harassment becomes a problem. Like, is it just sort of reflective? It, you know, is, is the, are the practices by the state reflective of the larger problem, or are they productive of that problem? You know, I'm thinking of Indonesia, where um, obviously I, I study, and you know, it's Muslim, 90% Muslim, there was a very secular oriented military authoritarian regime there 30 years. Um, very patriarchal, using uh, sexualized violence. You, know, you had the rape of the Chinese um, in 1998 and so on. But they also have a woman president, right, like five years later, um, which is kind of uh, stunning. stunning. And um, I was just wondering like, the way in which um, you, you see that relationship. Like, what are the particularities about Egypt? What are the particularities sort of about the Middle East? Um, or are the, is, is it just kind of a globalized problem? Um, so I guess uh, maybe a partial answer to your question is to sort of historicize like how it sort of became this sort of epidemic, right? And people start thinking about it as an epidemic. Um, and part of that has to do with, I think, right, right around like mid-2000s, um, you know, uh, there wasn't as much of a kind of female presence in the street and a lot of like, uh, like trade union protests or anti-government protests. And then um, the men were just, you know, being beaten and shot. So a tactic that kind of women had sort of developed together was that they would be on the front lines because these security forces wouldn't do anything to them, you know. And they were pious and they were wearing hijab and they stood as this kind of barrier between these people who were protesting in the military. And so the military ended up basically institutionalizing harassment and violence against women as a way to get them off the street again, thinking if they roughed them up a little bit, they would just go back home. And so that didn't really happen, um, but you can kind of see a shift in how that's become more acceptable, but also as a kind of, of a tool of intimidation, a tool of political intimidation that you know we saw happening quite a bit during the demonstrations. Now, I mean, I have, you know, I, I think people get sexually harassed during all kinds of political demonstrations, so I don't think there's anything specific about Egypt than, you know, uh, St. Patty's Day parade in New York City, right? So, um, I mean, I'm not trying to make those kinds of distinctions, but I am trying to say that talking about it as a cultural problem has broader violent implications, um, you know, than just thinking about sexual harassment, right, in terms of kind of how we think about the Middle East, how we think about world war with the Middle East. Thanks for the talk. That was super interesting. Um, I'm wondering how much the project is imagined to um, contribute to a greater global, perhaps, awareness of sexual violence. And I guess I'm thinking about, um, you know, previous situations like the Bosnian War and even uh, um, the war in Darfur, and perhaps even the oppressions in um, Burma, Myanmar. So those were, um, in particular Bosnia, I think there was a tremendous amount of sexual violence, and feminists were <coughs> trying as hard as they could to bring that awareness yes. to outside of the country, um, to the US. And I think that they were only partially successful until eventually at the end it became more when the US got involved, it became more um, no, well known. So I was just wondering that are they imagined when the women who are doing something like that, are they imagining this as a way of <coughs> increasing awareness that this is happening to them in their space? It's a I think it's a way I don't know if they think that people don't know that it's happening. I mean, the way that they talk about it, it's 
one, it's a way to give women a kind of outlet. So they've talked about how like you're feeling harassed and something happens to you and you kind of have nowhere to go or nowhere to talk to you. Just putting that message in the phone can give you a kind of feeling of relief or that you did something about it, right? Um, uh, uh, I do think it probably is kind of part of an awareness campaign as well. Um, but I, I also see it as kind of punitive a little bit, especially when I would kind of go through these reports and I would see pictures uploaded of you know young men who are saying things or whatever, like the image from the men in the cars from a report. Um, you know, I just when I think when I see stuff like that, I wonder about like you know that picture is going to be online forever. And so I mean I know they like messed up, but like what do we think about rehabilitating harassers? Like there's no language about that in any of this, any of these reports. It really seems very punitive. So you know we have we have to we have to live with each other, right? So like is this the best way to do that? I, I don't I don't know. You know I'm skeptical. If the map is really the way to do that, I think yes. <clears throat> Sorry, you keep mentioning the individual part, and I'm interested in kind of the way that the map represents the data is kind of different from the kind of Foucauldian way of surveillance, which will discipline or individualize. So I'm kind of curious what it is. I mean, what you've just said is a pretty good example about how it's managing individuals differently by presenting them and recirculating their images forever without necessarily disciplining <coughs> them or trying to get them to change. But I couldn't help also look at that map and think it kind of shows where you would go if you wanted to commit sexual violence and get away with it. Right? You'd either go, go go where the red dot isn't and then you won't be reported or go where the red dot is and there's so many incidents. Find friends who are doing it too. Yeah. I mean it, the map is not just mapping where harassment is happening but also where potentially it can happen. Or where the state is very active. Yeah. I mean that was something that I had suggested. Like maybe they said, I mean, in, in other research, I, you know, I like, I read blogs and things, and there's a story about a woman who was basically shut in and locked in her house because she had been blogging like anti government sentiment. And she, these men, there's like five or six of them who she knew about the video, were just hanging around outside of her house, and she was afraid to leave. So, you know, what could she do? Well, if she didn't have that idea, she could text it an SMS report and then like send them something about harassment. I mean, it would, present a different picture about what was really happening. You know what I mean? So I just, I'm not sure if that answers the Foucault part. <laughs> I'm just curious, what, how is it managing individuals differently than observing people in the panopticon, whatever, manages their... I mean, you know, uh, again, maybe a partial answer to that would be how, uh, can, how uh, communications campaigns are deployed, right? They're looking at that particular uh, spot on a map and then they're going out there and they're kind of forcing conversations with people. They're forcing them to sign documents. Sometimes they can't read those documents. Um, they're telling shopkeepers that, you know, basically if you don't put a harassment sticker in your window, you should be either shamed into doing that or we may encourage people not to go do business at your store, right? So these are kind of maybe more the same, maybe kind of the Foucaultian sort of policing techniques that you're talking about. But a lot of that is contingent on how the data is organized, right, through this idea of individuals reducing these experiences to kind of quantitative index that can then be used to act upon real space. Any final questions? I wonder if you know, Beyond Weissman's response to politics of radicalization forensics, right? Yeah. Can help not only critique, but also think of different kinds of alternatives, different kinds of ways of investigating, right, creating forums, instead of what seems like a way to help security implement a certain kind of <coughs> regime of, you know, uh, violence against men, and even seems like a skipping of certain kinds of procedures, right? To yeah. Those. I use the OIs a lot in this piece, particularly for thinking about kind of how they see their territory as volumetric as opposed to just sort of a two-dimensional map space. Mm -hmm. And then that has to do with kind of the materiality of the assemblages that the map has to use in order to pre present this kind of two-dimensional picture, right? Satellites in the sky, all the way kind of <coughs> right down to a smartphone.
our phone. Um, but yeah, he was very influential for me for thinking about that video. It's based on my metric. Well, thank you very much for your time.